James Urban Rupert, born April 12, 1934 was responsible for one of the deadliest shootings inside a private residence in U.S. history. On Easter Sunday, March 30, 1975, Rupert murdered 11 family members in his mother's house at 635 Minor Avenue in Hamilton, Ohio, in what has been referred to as the Easter Sunday Massacre. James Rupert's early life was very troubled. His mother, Charity, had told him that she would have preferred to have a daughter as her second child. His father, Leonard, also had a violent temper and held little affection for his two sons. Leonard died in 1947 when James and his brother Leonard Jr. were aged 12 and 14. Leonard Jr. became the father figure of the family and would constantly pick on James during their childhood, often taunting him calling him weak. At age 16, James ran away and attempted to commit suicide by hanging himself with a sheet. He was unsuccessful and returned home. As an adult James was described as a modest, bookish, and helpful man who was unremarkable and quiet. In addition, he had no police record. By 1975, James became jealous of his older brother's successful job and family. James had dropped out of college and then trained as a draftsman, although by 1975, he was unemployed, had never married, and was still living at home with his mother. His older brother, Leonard Jr., had earned a degree in electrical engineering, had married James's ex-girlfriend, owned his own home in the city of Fairfield, and had eight children. Charity was frustrated with James's inability to hold a steady job and his constant drinking. She had threatened to evict him from her home on more than one occasion. James also owed his mother and brother money, having lost much of what little cash he had in the stock market crash of 1973. A month before the massacre, James inquired about silencers for his weapons while purchasing ammunition. His behavior in general became more unusual as he neared his breaking point, while battling deep depression. On March 29, 1975, his 41st birthday, witnesses had seen him engaging in target practice shooting tin cans with his .357 Magnum along the banks of the Great Miami River in Hamilton. The night before the murders, James went out as he did nearly every night. At the 19th Hole Cocktail Lounge he talked with employee Wanda Bishop, a 28-year-old mother of five. She would later state that James told her he was frustrated with his mother's demands on him and his impending eviction and that he needed to solve the problem. According to Bishop, James stated that his mother had complained that if he could afford to buy beer seven nights a week, he could afford to pay rent. James left the bar at 11 p.m. that night and later returned. When Bishop asked him if he had solved the problem, he replied, No, not yet. James stayed at the bar until it closed at 2.30 a.m. On Easter Sunday, March 30, 1975, Rupert's brother Leonard and his wife, Oma, brought their eight children ranging from ages 4 to 17 to see their grandmother at the house on Minor Avenue. James stayed upstairs, sleeping off a night of drinking, while the other family members performed an Easter egg hunt on the front lawn. At around 4 p.m., James woke up went downstairs when his brother Leonard asked him how his Volkswagen was. That's when James flew into a rage and stomped back upstairs. James had always been paranoid. He imagined that his mother and brother were whispering about him to the FBI, for example, that he was a homosexual or a communist. He also worried that Leonard had booby-trapped his old Volkswagen. He then loaded his .357 Magnum, 2.22 caliber handguns, and a rifle, then went downstairs. He stepped into the kitchen with a .357 Magnum pistol in one hand and a .22 in the other, and he began firing. Leonard was first to fall, followed by sister-in-law Alma and mother Charity. Amid screams and chaos, the three children in the kitchen, Anne, David, and Teresa, were shot next. James then moved to the living room, where he was confronted at the door by the oldest nephew, 17-year-old Leonard III. James then shot him several times. James then sat on the sofa and one by one, shot at the remaining four children, Michael, Tommy, Carol, and little John. James then got up and walked from one victim to the next, firing bullets into them 35 rounds in all. He then lounged in the house for three hours before contacting the police. Charity was preparing lunch in the kitchen, in the company of Leonard Jr. and Alma. Most of the children were playing in the living room. James entered the kitchen, and he first shot and killed his brother Leonard. He then killed his sister-in-law Alma and his mother. Next, he took the life of his nephew David and his nieces Teresa and Carol, all in the confines of the kitchen. James then proceeded to the living room, where he killed his niece Anne and his four remaining nephews, Leonard III, Michael, Thomas, and John. One child had been shot once in the chest, 
The remaining 10 victims had been shot three times, to ensure they had died. The only sign of a struggle at the crime scene was one overturned waste paper bin. The Butler County coroner theorized that James had likely shot some victims more than once to prevent anyone from escaping. The massacre was over within five minutes. After spending three hours in the house, James finally called the police to report the shooting. He waited just inside the front door for authorities to arrive. The murders shocked the town of Hamilton and the entire country. Those who knew James Rupert did not think he was capable of doing something so horrible. By all accounts, neighbors considered the Ruperts a nice family. James was arrested and charged that day with 11 counts of aggravated homicide. He refused to answer questions asked by the police and was very uncooperative. He made it clear he would plead insanity. County Prosecutor John Holcomb viewed the crime scene and stated that there was so much blood on the first floor. It was dripping through the floorboards into the basement, which to this day can still be seen on the wood. James had fired a total of 35 rounds and all four weapons were recovered at the scene. All 11 victims were buried in Arlington Memorial Gardens in Cincinnati, Ohio. A year later, the house was opened to the public and everything in the house was auctioned off. It was then cleaned, repeated, and rented to a family new to the area, whose members were unaware of the murders that had taken place there. The new family later left the house, claiming they were hearing voices and other unexplained noises. Other families have moved in and out of the house and are said to still be occupied today. The original trial was held in Hamilton, Ohio. The three-judge panel found Rupert guilty on 11 counts of murder and sentenced him to life in prison. A mistrial was declared, and it was decided that the retrial would be held in Fendley, Ohio, because it was believed he could not receive a fair trial in the city of Hamilton. The second trial began in June 1975 and prosecutors revealed evidence involving the witnesses who had seen James engaging in target practice, asking about silencers for his gun collection, and admitting that his mother's expectations were a problem that he needed to solve. In July 1975 James received 11 consecutive life sentences. A new trial was granted in 1982. Defense attorney Hugh D. Halbrock was convinced his client was insane and personally funded the hiring of expert psychiatrists and psychologists from all over the country. Along those same lines, doctor, isn't it true that you have no way of telling the court what Mr. Rupert's ability to rationally discuss the case with his attorneys to rationally assist in the preparation of a defense would be if he were not under the effect of either a major tranquilizer such as Thorazine or Trilophon at this time. Isn't that right? Uh, I have no specific way of telling that other than to say that um, during the course of my examination with him, he was able at that time and under that condition with that dosage of medication to rationally confer with me and talk to me about what had happened. On July 23, 1982, another three-judge panel found James guilty on two counts of first-degree murder of his mother and brother, but found him not guilty on the other nine counts of murder, by reason of insanity. He received one life sentence for each count to be served consecutively. Because capital punishment had been suspended in the United States from 1972 to 1976 he could not receive the death penalty for his crimes because the murders occurred in 1975. James Rupert remains incarcerated in the Franklin Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio, a unit of the Ohio Department of Rehabilitation and Correction. In June 1995, at the age of 61, he was granted a hearing before the State Parole Board, but his release was denied. He received another hearing in April 2015, at which release was again denied. His next hearing is set for February 2025, when he will be 90. The story you first saw on WCPO.com, a family lives where the Easter massacre happened more than 30 years ago. Nine on your side's Tony Morones tells us the family says everything's okay at the house, and neighbors say the gawkers are fun to toy with. There's a family here on Minor Avenue that's living in a house where 11 people were massacred more than 30 years ago. The neighborhood just says it's just a house. On this block, it's, oh, there's a lot of traffic for Lindenwald. It's a spectacle. It's a it's a sightseeing type thing. You know what I mean? So a lot of times around Halloween, people will just start driving by, start thinking of haunted Ohio. The scariest decorated house on the block is this one, but that's not what folks are interested in. You'll see people like they'll park down the street and walk 
up and down both sides of the street. They came to see the house that belongs to the Baker family. They call Minor Avenue, Massacre Avenue. Sometimes inconvenient when you're walking out to go get lunch with your son and someone just walks right up, you know, and they want to have a talk about the house or something like that. But, you know, <laughs> it doesn't happen all that often. Baker's referring to our interview. Girl. <laughs> The neighborhood does have fun with those who are curious. I've had people come up to my house thinking it was the Rupert house. I live on the other side of the street. And it's, well, my thing was I played along with them. <laughs> Know this. If you go by, remember, people live here. You know, how would you feel if somebody was sitting at your house all day trying to, you know, wait for something to happen? I mean, a lot of people think I'm crazy for living here, but um, it's not creepy. It's my house. It's my home. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe for more videos like this one.